big picture of it. I'm not going to get too much into the mathematical details of, uh, of the model, but just to give you an idea of, of what we are trying to do and what we are trying to accomplish. So the, the, um, okay, the first idea is um, we want to detect corruption uh, by looking at the data. So there are many ways to detect corruption. Uh, you can do ABFT, which is algorithm-based uh, fault tolerance, which is trying to change your, algor your algorithm uh, to uh, have a sort of checking a mechanism at the end of your kernel or, or whatever, or your function or whatever it is that you, you're writing to validate that the results that your computer were accurate uh, and that no, no corruption happened uh, uh, during, the, during the function. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is very good, uh, but we wanted to try another uh, way because, uh, for example, ABFT is very uh, intrusive. You have to change your algorithms, you have to change your uh, code, you have to change your application, uh, and you have to do this in a different way for different types of kernels, for different types of functions, uh, and that's the, that requires a lot of time, a lot of uh, um, programming work, uh, and so it's very hard. Now, I'm not saying that we should not use ABFT. I'm saying that um, in addition to ABFT, we, you, we, we were interested in looking at different ways uh, where we don't have to change the application that is more or less uh, application agnostic and that, uh, um, that don't require any, almost anything uh, from the programmer itself. So the idea was to look at the data and try to see if we could, during the execution, learn how the data behave and say, okay, this is uh, the normal trend, and then when something uh, different happens, uh, then try to say, uh, okay, is this, uh, is this because or there's a change in regime of the application, or is it because actually a corruption happened, uh, and then uh, this result is just completely crazy. Uh, and the idea that we came uh, was that, um, uh, that, that we um, tried to explore is that the data sets of HPC applications are offer a certain level of smoothness and they don't change drastically in time, neither space. So uh, basically what I'm trying to say, if you look at a, <coughs> at a figure produced by a, by a climate uh, application, uh, you have, well, you have different temperatures in different parts of the, of the grid, but you will probably not see uh, that over this big area is about 30 degrees, and then this little dot over here is minus 50. Uh, that would be very strange. Uh, and then uh, this, this particular um, notion of smoothness is what could allow us uh, to say, OK, when you have a corruption, that maybe will uh, produce uh, a difference in a particular point that will be uh, very easy to see for us uh, if we analyze the data. So uh, if you have, for example, a data set, a two-dimensional data set in this, in this case, you can analyze the data set and, and then produce uh, histograms uh, about what is the distribution of the data uh, for this particular data set. And then you can keep doing that for every iteration or every exit iteration of your application um, by just uh, looking at the, at the data set. Remember that in FTI you give a pointer to your data set and say, hey, please protect this, uh, this data set, right? So we already have the data. We can parse it because we know the size of the data set. We know the type, we know pretty much everything that is required to know. So we can look at it, and then we can create these uh, histograms and say, okay, this is how my application, this is how these data set behave. And when I see something that is completely um, out of this uh, histogram, then I say, I can raise an alert and say, hey, this is something strange. So this is what we call uh, the gamma detector, because in here we are just looking at the data set. Um, then, uh, what we, the second idea that we try to explore is to look at the space differences. So as I say, uh, we think that the difference between uh, close points in a space here should be uh, bounded uh, somehow. And as I say, it's, it's, it's unlikely that you have a certain pressure uh, around this region, and then in one particular spot you have a completely different pressure uh, and making a, a, a delta that is huge. Uh, so we look at many data sets of uh, HPC applications and we notice that this is actually true. Uh, and then uh, we can actually use the delta between 
close points in the space to say, okay, uh, the data is, then we can create histograms with the delta. So this is not the data set itself, but the delta between um, close points in space. And then when we have something that is uh, completely crazy, we, we can raise an alert. We do the same in time. Uh, so I can, for one particular point, I can compare the distance between the previous value and the current value. And I can make, again, the same histogram saying, okay, the distance between, for a particular point in a space, the distance between two uh, time steps is probably this, is around here, or around here, but it's, it follows this distribution. And when I get something that is out of this distribution, then uh, I can raise an alert. And finally, uh, the, the, the last detector uh, is the, what we call the zeta detector, which is basically the time difference of the space difference, right? So this is what this detector is telling you, is how the difference in a space changes in time. This is, uh, this is the idea that we try. And again, we create these histograms and say, okay, this is the distribution of this uh, delta, which is basically the more or less the second derivative of, of the space differences. Um, and, and with this distribution, we might be able to detect corruption when it happens. <clears throat> uh, then uh, we came up with a technique uh, to reduce um, the uh, memory that is required for these techniques to work. Uh, as you know, uh, for example, if you have a two domain and you want to make the difference between the previous time step, uh, previous time step and this time step, that means that you somehow need to remember the previous time step. Uh, that also, of course, involves some overhead in memory because uh, that means you have to keep all the previous data at one time step before in memory. So this is pretty expensive uh, memory-wise. Uh, so what we did is to uh, lose a little bit of accuracy and use the, the, the data set, the distribution that, we, that I showed in the previous figure, uh, which is basically using use uh, 256, 256 bins. Uh, why 256? Because that you can map it in one byte, right? Um, and then um, you can say, okay, instead of re recording the previous time step, I can just use one byte to point to the index in this table to the value that is the closest to the value that I had in the previous time step, right? So now I just have to keep a table of 256 floats or doubles. And then for every uh, point in my grid, I do have one byte that will point into the right position in this grid. So this is basically just an indexing technique. It is, I'm not the first one to use it. Uh, I think this is pretty common in, in, in HPC. Uh, and then instead of having four or eight bytes of memory overhead, you just have uh, one byte of overhead uh, memory uh, of memory, memory overhead. Uh, so if you are using single precision, uh, you know, a uh, table of 256 floats that will require just one kilobyte in extra memory. If you are using double precision, it's two kilobytes. Um, and then for um, the one particular byte that you need to uh, record for every data, for every grid point, uh, you have, well, depending on whether it's single or double precision, you will have about 0 0.25 or 0 0.12 uh, of overhead in, in memory. So this is just a little memory uh, overhead analysis uh, that we did. Okay. And then, uh, so again, we analyze uh, the format of the floating point uh, uh, representation. So you have the sign, you have the exponent, and you have the mantissa. Uh, I think this particular representation here uh, is showing this value, uh, 4.03 or whatever. Um, 0 0.32, whatever. And then, um, what this is trying, what what I want to show with this figure is, when you have a corruption that touches the first 16 uh, bits of this IEEE representation, that will change the value so much that uh, it will be out of uh, this range. So, for instance, if you had a, a a distribution that could tell you, well, the value for this particular grid point should be between 4.0 and 4.050. Uh, then, if you had this interval here, right? So any corruption happening here will produce uh, a, a different value <coughs> that will be out of this interval, right? 
So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, if you had a predictor using this uh, distribution uh, figure that I showed before that could give you an interval like this, basically you would be able to uh, detect any corruption uh, in the first 16 bits out of a 32 uh, floating point representation. So it's basically 50% of 50% of recall. Now, uh, you may not care about all the bit flips. Uh, again, if, depending on the accuracy of your application, uh, the bit flips occurring here might be within the error allowed by your application, and then you probably don't even care about those. Of course, that depends on the applications, that depends on the data, data sets, uh, but you know, uh, it's something interesting to analyze. And then uh, something that is also important, so here, for example, if you have a better predictor that can tell you, well, your data, your value should be within this interval, please notice that this interval is much smaller than this one, uh, then uh, any corruption in the first 24 bits uh, will be definitely uh, detected because the value will be out of this interval here. So you have about 75% of recall in this example. Now, as I said, there are some regions that are negligible, maybe, and there are other regions here where any corruption will create a value that is so crazy that my application will probably crash. So, uh, for instance, if I have a temperature in Kelvin, uh, and then I change the design bit here, and then I have a negative Kelvin temperature, then I hope your application will crash, because if it if doesn't happen, then it's, it's, it's a pretty bad coding technique, right? Um, there are other cases where the, the, the kernel can uh, become just completely unstable and, and then that will crash. So, so what I'm trying to say is that there are other cases here where we don't even perhaps need a detector because any corruption happening here will definitely produce an uh, application crash. So remember, these two regions here is probably too obvious and not even interesting to work on this. And here is very difficult, but probably we don't care. So what we are trying to analyze is Make the third, what we're trying to do is to make detectors that will see what happens here. So we, could, we work with this uh, CFD code, uh, CFD because it's a turbulent code, which uh, uh, we want to use uh, something challenging. Uh, and what you see in this representation is a two-dimensional cut of a three-dimensional tube uh, with a gas, uh, compressible gas flowing uh, through it. So you have the, the width of the tube and the length. Uh, and then this is the vorticity uh, plot, right? So uh, from zero to 1,000, so red it means uh, high vorticity. Vorticity, I rem remember, is kind of the spinning uh, speed of a particular point in a space. Uh, I want to uh, clarify that vorticity is actually not a data set of the application. So you don't have a, you don't have a pointer to a vorticity table in your memory. This is actually just uh, plotted uh, for visualization purposes, but in reality what you have inside your memory is velocities. You have velocities in x uh, dimension, y, and z. You have in the three dimensions, you have three, three velocities, and out of these velocities you compute the vorticity, uh, which is what you actually see at, at, the, at the end. But what in reality can be corrupted is velocities, not vorticity. Now if you look at the uh, velocities, uh, how do they look? They look completely different, right? So this is uh, the velocity in the x-axis, uh, and then you can see again uh, from uh, 0.9 to 1.0. So you can see already that the interval is pretty small, right? Any value that is out of this range, I would say I would be capable of detecting or saying, okay, this is a, this is a, a, a corruption. Uh, and then, well, I don't plot uh, all the other velocities, but you will see a figure that is uh, similar to this. So uh, uh, as you can see, it looks less chaotic than the previous one. Um, so here we injected a corruption, uh, it's not visible at the naked eye, uh, but it's actually here. So you can see there is a little white dot, more or less visible here. Uh, this is where we injected a corruption in the bit 20, if I remember correctly, uh, out of uh, 32. Uh, and then we analyze what happens when you inject this corruption. So uh, unfortunately the video is not running, but um, so. This is a logarithmic chart, and this is, so what we did is, uh, we did a normal run, and then we did a run, uh, a corrupted run. That means uh, with this, with the corruption that I, that I mentioned just here. And then, um, basically, y means, uh, so we computed the, the, the deviation, 
between the normal run and the corrupted run, right? So why means no corruption, no deviation. It is uh, it, the, the, the numerical values are completely equal between the two runs. This is a, st a time step uh, 15001, right? And we inject the corruption in the 15020. So 20 iterations later, we injected the corruption. Uh, and then what happens is that about 100 iterations after we injected the corruption, this is what we see, right? Uh, so we see that the corruption propagates uh, from the point where it was injected, which actually, which actually was 40 with 40, was about around this point. We injected the corruption, but remember that the flow is, the, the gas is flowing in that direction. So uh, you can see that this is actually the epicenter, but the epicenter moved uh, through the execution because this is 100 iterations later. Uh, 100 iterations later. Uh, and also I want to precise that it, this, the, the MPI processes are, so the data is distributed um, by segment. So for example, this segment here, it was uh, MPI rank zero, then you have MPI rank one, MPI rank two, and so on. Uh, and then we injected uh, the corruption in rank zero, and it moved out to the next ranks, as you can see. So you can see that uh, there is kind of a wave effect, and, and this is, uh, again, the deviation. So in the dark regions here, you have about, uh, you know, between uh, 0.01 uh, of 0.001 of deviation between the normal, the accurate value, and, and the corrupted value, right? Uh, so we did this for uh, many bit positions. So basically, what happens if you inject in bit 24, uh, 22, 20, and so on? Uh, what you see is that, of course, if you, if you inject corruption in bits of uh, uh, in heavy bits, you can see that the corruption is uh, is quite big. So, for example, for 24, this is the purple line that you see here. So what happens is that here we inject in about uh, 15 or 20, as I say. Here we inject. We can see that the, the error deviation spikes. And then it starts to dissipate somehow uh, as, a, as a wave. And then at some point here, it starts increasing again. What happens here is that actually the error deviation uh, kind of bounces on the walls of the system. And then it come back, comes back and then increments uh, to itself. You know, there is this, this, F, this wave effect that happens. And then you have the, uh, the, the deviation that increases again. And then at some point, it's kind of stabilized. And, and, and continue uh, being the same. So this is for B24, 22, 20, 18, 16, and so on. However, this, if you see for bits 2, 4, 6, and so on, uh, the deviation pretty much never goes over 10 to the minus 5. Uh, so if you are running an application uh, that requires a precision uh, that is uh, uh, less than 10 to the minus 4, uh, then maybe you don't care about corrosion, corrosion happening in, in, this, in this bit position. That's what I was saying uh, before. Depending on the accuracy needed by your application, these errors here might not be important for you. Um, so uh, to come back to the detectors, uh, finally, uh, you can see this is the distribution of data set. So as if you remember here, we say between 0 0.96 and 1.05. Uh, so this is the histogram uh, that you get. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy if, if you have a, cor uh, a, a corrupted value that is out of this interval, then it's, uh, it's very highly because of a corruption happening at some point. Um, now, what happens with the delta? The delta, remember, was the uh, space difference between consecutive neighbors, uh, between neighbor, neighbor points. Uh, and then you see that you have this uh, Pretty beautiful Gaussian shape, uh, so that you can see in addition that you know the deltas are within uh, 10 to the minus 2 precision, right? So this this interval here is much smaller than uh, this interval, meaning that if any corruption creating a delta that is with, out of this interval will be detected by the delta detector. Uh, then we have the epsilon detector, which was the time difference. Uh, for the same point in a space. Uh, you also have a Gaussian distribution with a different shape. Uh, again, more or less the same uh, precision interval. And this is the Zeta detector, which was the time evolution of the space uh, delta. 
and then again you have more or less a Gaussian distribution. But here you have, uh, you notice that uh, the, actually the zetas are much, much smaller. So from 0 0.0005 to minus 0 0.0005, right? So this interval is even smaller, meaning that probably in this case the zeta detector will be the one that will be the, uh, getting, uh, raising all the alerts in case of, uh, of uh, corruption. So if you put, if you plot, uh, for, insta for instance, gamma distribution with uh, delta distribution, then you would get a cloud of points uh, more or less like this. Uh, here, uh, the color means the level of uh, corruption. Uh, in this case, there is no corruption uh, because everything is blue here. Uh, but I'm going to show an, ex uh, an example with corruption later. And this is the cloud that you get when, by using the other two detectors, the epsilon and the zeta detectors. You get a cloud of points like this. So this is basically your data set, how it behaves. Uh, and then when you inject corruptions, now you see uh, the red color is injecting a corruption in the big 20 uh, and then up to the big zero. So when you have zero corruption, this is your cloud. However, if you see, if I inject, for example, in the big 14, my points that start to get out of the cloud. If you inject in 16, I get here, and 18, and so on. So you can see that um, Injecting corruption will take your data points completely out of the cloud, so that will be easily detectable. And if we use the other two uh, detectors, epsilon and zeta, your cloud and the distance between the new value, the corrupted value, and the cloud is so big that the cloud actually looks like a little blue dot now, right? So this is because the the the, the value created, the, the corrupted value is so away from the from the cluster of normal values that uh, it would be definitely easy for a detector to raise an alert saying, hey, the value is completely out of, uh, of. Now, this is the this is in injecting in the big 20. Remember that when I plot the figure, what I show in the circle of the, the corruption in the big 20 is, is barely visible to the naked eye, right? But here, using this technique is, complete, is, very, easy, is very easy to see. So, um, again, as I explained before, we're interested in what is happening here. Uh, this probably we don't care, and this will be obvious to detect for the application. Um, so we did these experiments with uh, the CFD application that I just mentioned, uh, injecting in all the bit positions. Uh, so if we inject in the bits 25 to 32, the application will crash. Um, it will start producing NAN values, uh, and then at some point that will crash. Um, <coughs> Uh, this part here is uh, is neglectable because, as I explained before, uh, the, the deviation produced, the, the error produced is less than 10 to the minus 5. And then what we try to cover is basically the rest of this area. And the, the green bars here is basically what we managed to detect uh, in this bit position. So you can see that from bit position 24 to 15, we get about 90%, uh, you know, 99.9% of uh, detection. So for each one of these bars, we injected thousands of bit flips, and we run with detectors to see if they could detect. So everything that happens in this green area, we detect with a 99.9% .9 of recall. Everything that happens here is the challenging future work. How, how do we do to move these bars a little bit further in this direction, that is a, that is a difficult problem. Uh, not sure if it's actually possible, but we are working on that. So <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say here is that this we want to detect. And then we did experiments for us uh, with another app application, which is the hack uh, application. It's a cosmology code, uh, embody simulation that tries to simulate the origin of the universe and the, uh, give an answer about what is dark matter and so on. Um, here, um, you have some crashes if you inject bit flips in the bits 29, 30, and so on here. Uh, they have a little bit more of uh, a larger region of uh, negligible uh, corruptions because uh, it's a, the application makes a statistical analysis uh, at the end of the, of the run. So uh, there are a lot of deviations that are insignificant for them. Uh, and then again, you can see this green area is what we can cover. Uh, around here is 99.9% .9 and then it increases 
uh, to about 80% for big position 13, and then at some point we have absolutely no detection in this in this region. So if we neglect the crash area and the negligible area, uh, basically we can say that out of this area from here to here, uh, we have a coverage of about 80%, uh, which, which is a detection recall of 70%. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much all I had to present. I hope that was not too long. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo.